Beg your pardon. Forgot to knock. <laughs> Welcome to Brother Tiny Sometimes Call, cool. myself, Ashley, and Ed. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Ash. How are you? Very good, thank you. And we are joined this evening by Pringland James, James Sylvester. <laughs> hello. Hello, chaps. How are we doing? That little little catchphrase there was a hint to what we were talking about this evening. Ed, what are we talking about? We are talking about the 1995 James Bond classic, Golden Eye. someone else. Do you know, I always say, oh, I love this, I love that, I love this. This has got to probably be the, my favourite Brosnan one. The only time Pierce Brosnan looks better as Bond is probably the beginning of The World is Not Enough. Apart from that, I cannot find, I'm going to put my cards on the table before we even start, I cannot find anything wrong with this film. Actually, no, there's one scene I can't unsee, which is during the Aston Martin and the Ferrari chasing each other. There's a like a continuity, like an error on there. A blooper, shall we say, which I'll show you in a minute, guys. But apart from that, love it. I can't find any fault with it. He is perfect as Bond in this role. That's that's my bit. There we are, then. No, but it, I remember going to see this in the cinema. I didn't pay tickets for it, actually. I knew the lady who was um, the manageress of the cinema. And um, I went upstairs to the bit where the public don't usually go, because there was still seats in there. And I watched it there with my mum and... Uh, the manageress's husband and a few other people and it, when he came on the screen I wasn't overly first on the gun barrel I didn't like the digitized one if I'm honest I preferred the old gun barrel I didn't like the CGI effects but as soon as the uh, the pre-title started loved it and I think he looks really good in this pre-title especially when he's running down the runway and he's there with the machine gun <laughs> Going off into a little daze and a dream about. <laughs> if my wife's listening, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I think he really does look the part. Now, this is how you should look as Bond because I I pretended to criticise Timothy Dalton for how he looked in Licence to Kill, um, especially with his hair when he slipped back and longer hair and so on. But I mean, really, Pierce Brosnan had more hair in this, you know. But it was styled right, and he looked spot on. I'm just saying. <laughs> Just saying, just saying. It was a, it was a very mid nineties haircut, that wasn't it? It really, it really was. <laughs> There's no getting away from that slightly bouffant 
<laughs> but trimmed at the back, yeah. <laughs> He is, he's a good-looking chap, though, isn't he, Pierce Brosnan, to be fair? You he know? is a handsome fella. Do you he, know what? He's he, one of those men who um, he looks better the older he gets. I, I, the look of him now, I think, my word, what a handsome chap you are now. But, um, yeah, I think we, talk, we talked about on um, a previous video of yours, I think probably when, when Rob uh, Valentine was with us, and we were talking about what if Brosnan had got the part in 86, 87, when Living Daylights came out, we said yeah, he probably was too young. He was a bit willowy. He wasn't. He didn't quite have the stature to properly pull it off. By '95, that that part was his. It really was his. Um, and he, it, yeah, he, he hammers it home with with every second of screen time he has. It's it's great. Ed, what were your thoughts? Because you watched it as always. Ed's been good. Then his revision. Like being back yes. in school, but I can't fault you for that, Ed. You do it every week without fail, and I wing it. Sorry, <laughs> uh, a very uncommitted part of bow ties sometimes cool. But you watched it, Ed, and what do you think? I did. So I loved it back in 1995. I loved it in 2023 as well. Um, I, I think I've, I'm on record as saying 1989 was not a good year for films for me. License to Kill is one of the very, very, very few films I've actually left the cinema before the end of the film. I found it so dull, and I thought that was the end of Bond. I really thought that had killed the Bond franchise. And it sort of did for six years, uh, sort of, maybe. I, don't, I know the rights things and all that, but um, but this was, going back, it was a Bond film, how I felt Bond films should be made. It had, you know, it had your d- dashingly, devilishly debonair lead. Um, you know, you could, I couldn't have imagined as good as Timothy Dalton was, as authentic a Bond as Timothy Dalton was. I can't imagine him driving a tank and straightening his tie. <laughs> but Pierce <laughs> Brosnan has got the spirit of Roger Moore in him. He's sort of he's not probably as Austin Powers as Roger Moore was in his last years. But he's a lovely balance between sort of Roger Moore and um, maybe Lazenby. He's got that sort of balance between him. I saw it in the cinema, fell back in love with the Bond franchise immediately. And I think it was around the time then they were reissuing them on VHS. And I went and bought the whole collection on VHS again, purely on the, purely based on how good Golden I was. So, yeah, an absolute hit of a film. Watching it, so we modernise. It's quite interesting how... They were. They had sort of taken on board all the criticisms that Bond was it for fit for purpose in the nineties. You know, he was, as M says to him, "You're a relic from the Cold War, a sexist, misogynist dinosaur," and that's what Bond's character is. But they took that on board and they ran with it and they made that part of the storyline that you yeah. know you can't get away with sort of treating women like you do anymore. It's like Money Penny is a lot more of an assertive character in this with Samantha Bond. You've got the head of MI5 is now a woman who's probably tougher than any of the men who played at M before her. Um, mm. So, yeah, it was of its time. It was trying to do the right thing, but there's only so much you can do with a central character like James Bond, but it did what it needed to do to survive. It absolutely did. And I, I agree completely, Ed. I mean, they, they took that hold. People were talking about it. I remember it vaguely in the press. I was quite young at the time, but it was like... It was was. Does anybody really want to watch another Bond film? Bond Bond Bond's gone. Bond's dead. We've moved on. And I think Martin Campbell made the point um, some years later when he was talking about having directed it, and he said at the time, and it was very much the case in the early to mid nineties, action heroes had moved moved on very much from being the romantic antihero to being blue collar. They were every man. Um, you know, Bruce Willis and and um, Arnie, people like that. They were the action heroes. So to go back and say, well, actually, we're going to have a I suppose a disenfranchised, unhappy member of really the elite, an upper class guy or an upper middle class guy, it dressed in dressed in black tie and a tux. Um, he's going to be your hero for the for the nineties. It was quite revolutionary in its way. I mean, you you were always going to bring the you know the, the the older fan base who had an emotional connection to Bond. Were you going to bring young people with you? And much as you guys know, I I adore Timothy Dalton. I could watch Timothy Dalton stand alone in an empty room for two hours and think it was good. Um, but I have to. I was disappointed that they recast. I understand the reasons why. I understand, you know, Dalton didn't want to commit to another three, four, five films, which I completely get. Um, but as soon as you see it, and I'm not a huge fan of most of Brosnan's films, this is by far my favourite of. As soon as you see him in the role, he absolutely 
throws all of those doubts out of the window. Yes, Bond is still relevant. They tackle that, but you're a cold. You're, you're a relic of the Cold War, as you say. You, you're, you're a you're a legacy. You're a dinosaur. Um, no, no, I'm not. I might have those th- th- those facets to me, but I'm still relevant, and I'm still um, I'm, I'm still your hero for them for the, for, a, for a modern world. Um, that's really reflected in everything Brosnan brings to it, um, in the look of the film, the feel of the film. I don't like the score, but maybe we can get onto that later. Um, and I think the marketing campaign, I remember the trailer uh, for it when it's, um, I don't even recall, it was him coming along and he says, it's a new world, there's new threats, but you can still rely, still depend and rely on one man. And then Brosnan walks on the screen doing the gun barrel thing. And I think it was exactly the right way to market that when people were having doubts about the franchise and the character and its relevance. Yeah, they tackle it head on and absolutely blew those doubts away within within seconds. Now, I totally agree with you. I'm going to pick up on two things. I'm not really even going to elaborate, really, but two things that you mentioned. One about Arnie and, and sort of like the heroes at that time. Interesting, because this was pretty much around about the same time as uh, True Lies. Ed, you need to get True Lies into your belt. Great film, but a bit different. I um, can't remember what the second thing he said, was it, James? It'll come in. Wait a second. Wait a second. No, maybe it wasn't James. It might have been you, Ed. That little mix between hit, um, sort of been quite uh, a good mix between Lazenby and Roger. Roger, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this film was written for Timothy Dalton, predominantly. They had to do a bit of a rewrite on it, which is why it's a bit harder-edged. I haven't counted it myself, but I'm reliably informed that this has got the most kills in it. Bond kills 46 people in this film, um, all with a few quips and a smile. Um, and somehow Pierce Brosnan gets away with it. So... Um, yeah, that, that was. I feel like he's a bit of a blend of all of them, really. Um, Roger, he was. I, I think he intentionally tried to be because he, he was quite, um, quite open about Connery and Moore being his favourite Bonds. And I think he very much tried to style himself in that. You just hit on with the kill count. My, I say one issue. I have two issues because I mentioned the score. I don't like Eric Serra Scott. He's a brilliant, um, a brilliant artist. I don't think he was suited to score a Bond film. Um, but the other one is the kill count. Most of them absolutely fine. But the way he machine guns his way to escape past an entire squadron or company or whatever of presumably more or less innocent soldiers who were just there to guard him. It didn't have anything to do with the you know the maniacal plot behind it all. And he machine gunned them down to make his escape was a little bit of what exactly are these guys done to deserve that. But I suppose that ties into the ruthlessness of it. And it was, as you say, it was a Tim Dalton script. You can imagine Dalton's Bond doing that and not batting an eyelid. Brosnan was always more, I suppose, openly compassionate as a as a Bond. Um, so I, that what that is the one scene that does slightly stick in my craw. Uh, you were referring to the scene at the beginning there, though. It's a strange one, really, because there's well, yeah, it's strange because it's hard edged. You see, it's like a bit of a comical Bond because he's there with. 007, uh, sorry, 006, Alec Trevelyan, and they're having a bit of banter back and forth between them. They're on a serious mission, but it's all like, shut the door and this and the other, and all, putting these timers on it. Then when he sees that, you know, 006 gets shot, there's that, there's a few seconds, there's like a, a split second of like raw emotion in, in space. Where mm. it's like quite really well done. And then yeah. he goes from that to, machine getting into people down, which could be because he's ruthless or it could just be because he's got the, that emotion because of what's happened to the film. It was. It was actually the, the later on in the film when he was being interrogated by the, the minister um, and he's escaping with um, Isabella Skorupko, who's, who's brilliant. Oh, in that, in, in that sorry, part. yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, be, just before the tank chase. And, you know, I get it. His only way out is to kill these people. Um, it just... I don't remember another Bond film in which so many innocent inverted commas have been so ruthlessly gone down but that is a very minor quibble in a film i really enjoy now can i go back to my minor quibble for a second i want you to stop this car please stop this car at once as you can see i have no problem with female authority (laughs) I'm all right with this. So far, so good. You're incorrigible. What am I going to do with you? Let's toast your evaluation, shall we? Mm. Mm. 
No, you cannot be that close to the railing. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna to have to blink at that point. Yeah, I go and make a coffee at that stage. Into it like that. <laughs> so whilst we're actually on YouTube, guys, um, obviously the listeners will not be watching my screen. I will have spliced these little clips in. But uh, any favourite scenes that stand out for you? Ed, I'll defer to you, to, to you for this because there's so many I could pick. No, okay, I. I must admit, I, I love the tank chase. I think the tank chase is fantastic. And also, um, the bungee jump on the dam right at the opening is just amazing. Right. Okay. So, Golden Iron presumably is set in 1995. Yes. Right. Okay. Fine. So, right after the opening credits, where you go to the Ferrari scene, just show it says it shows nine years later. So, so the bit in the dam was in 1986. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And we did. Yes. You, you but he'd well. been Roger, Roger Moore or Timothy Dalton then. Oh, <laughs> Would he even been alive then? We don't know. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. All right, Ed. Good point. Well made. <laughs> we'll move on for that. Ed, if you're getting quibbles about that, I can't wait for the reboot of the Bond films now. <laughs> how are you going like, to reconcile that one in your mind? It's like a Doctor Who episode. Hey, now let's just Ed, let's have a look at your little um, tie job. It's a bit of an ongoing thing with uh, with Pierce Brosnan. He also does it in the world. There's not enough, you know, when he's in his little speedboat, the cubo, and he goes. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Love it. Got a nice bit of product placement for Pedia there as well. Absolutely. <laughs> and I really do like, I mean, I, I take on board what you say, James, about the soundtracks. It's, it's like, what was it? Uh, sort of um, metal drums and stuff like that type thing. Um, but I think they get the Bond thing there. I, it really feels like wow, well, Bond is back. Interesting point, though, that it wasn't originally in there. In the score that um, Eric Serig, um turned in, that was scored very differently. If you if you um, if if you YouTube that later, you'll see the original score, um, and it was nothing like that. So he's similar to, I suppose, Monty Norman, um, and his his original arrangement of the Bond theme being uh, done over by John Barry. They got I don't I forget who, and that that's awful of me, but they got someone else to come in and score that sequence because obviously that is the big Bond is back sequence. And it was scored completely differently, which is one of the issues I have. And again, no disrespect at all to the composer, who I think has done some beautiful work, but he's just not he's not the right dude to get a, to do a Bond film. I mean, everything about this movie in terms of relaunching the character, they just got right. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, good scenes before. I think um, you know, the Q scene um, was everything you wanted it to be. You, you didn't want Q to be recast. You wanted the old reassuring Desmond Llewell in there. Uh, and he was, and I think they wrote that beautifully, beautifully well. It was, it was so good. Even the references to M's predecessor, you know, your predecessor um, kept some cognac in the in the top drawer. It's, no, 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 that's done. I prefer bourbon, but a, it's a call back to what was. The Aston Martin appearance was a call back to what was, but it goes on to drive the BMW. So everything was about saying, "This is the character that you love, and we're going to take him in a new direction." And everything they did to present Brosnan in that part in that film was brilliant. Similar paradox, though, to I think Daniel Craig. And I know we disagree on this, chaps, but I love Casino Royale as a movie, and I think every subsequent Craig film got worse. I don't get the love in for Skyfall. I don't get the love in for uh, No Time to Die. If I'm really honest, they're good in many ways, but they're not they're not as good as what came first. And I think the same was true with with, with Piers. Um, I'm oh, sorry, Pierce. Goldeneye was magnificent. Tomorrow Never Dies was okay. 
world was not world is not enough. Yeah, I'll watch it and die another day. My my word. Let's let's not even talk about it. So yeah, everything about Bond and Brosnan's Bond was perfect in this film. Picking up on that, I mean, I, I don't like much to do with Daniel Craig's film, so it's not anything personal about anyone of these films. But, yeah, I mean, Martin Campbell directed this one and Casino Royale. So, you know, did come I up think there's a lot to be said in that. Now, have you ever seen um, the deep fake of Timothy Dalton in the pre-title? No. Uh, let's have a quick look. This is how it could have been if Tim had come back. James? England. It's too easy. Half of everything is luck, James. And the other half? Fate. It appears we share the same passions. Three, anyway. I can't do. Motoring and... Uh... Wheat or Laban? Seven. Madame wins. I hope the third is where your real talent lies. Penny Penny. Identification confirmed. On a top, Xenia, ex Soviet fighter pilot. Current suspected links to the Yanis crime syndicate, St. Petersburg. Yacht Manticore is leased to a known Yanis corporate front. M authorizes you to observe Miss Onotop, but stipulates no contact without prior approval. End transmission, Money Penny. Hmm. Mate, yeah, I, I, I would watch Tim Dalton in Goldeneye all day long. I mean, the script has him written all over it, but um, I'm not going to take anything away from uh, from, from Pierce's performance in that. It was, it, it was, yeah, he was magnificent. Got to give a shout out to Sean Bean as well. My only issue with that, and again, I keep saying I love everything about this film, but I, and I keep finding issues with it. Sean Bean in 1995, we're really going to believe that he's old enough to be the son of a Lienz Cossack. Uh, mm, let's let's bypass. I don't, I don't know. It was supposed to be um, Hopkins. Uh, he was offered the role, and um, um, Alan Rickman was offered the role, and they both they both turned it down. I love Sean Bean. I, yeah, I love Sharp. That's a, a whole other series we could talk about maybe one day. Um, and I think he's absolutely dynamite in that role. But just the one that the one point of Alliance Cossack, really, you're about thirty. <laughs> no, no, you're not. <laughs> but let's move on from that. It, it was great, and I think the re, you know that revenge element, that wonderful scene at the end, you know, for England, James. No, for me. Um, it was perfectly done, perfectly done. So, big shout out to Sean Bean for the success of the film, and a much better way to use John Doe Baker after that absolutely wasted character in Living Daylights. Um, I mean, you know, he, he got, I suppose, he got that role in the back of the um, the Omega Man, but um, sorry, um, Edge of Darkness, I'm thinking of. Um, but he was completely wasted as, as Whitaker. But this is a much better way to use his talents, and um, yeah. I, I enjoyed the happy you know, Bond having a new CIA liaison. It was, it was all those little touches were really, really well done. So we've uh, gone through a couple of my favourite scenes there, clear ones. Uh, I like the pen in it. Alan Cummins quite good in it as Boris. I'm invincible. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he is. He is going to be. He's clearly the comic relief character, isn't he? But um, really nasty for a for, for a, a fun. Um, laughable character he, he can be quite cruel um really comedic death scene <laughs> yes yeah just it's frozen yeah yes i am invincible Um, and Ed, you started saying because you really like the tank chasing. There must be something a bit more. Yeah. Anyone? Well, do, you know, do you know, sort of characterization wise I mean, Bond films is they're almost formulaic in, in a brilliant sort of way. But this one, I can't remember the character's name. The Russian general. To begin with, he's very, very confident, and as he's he's realizing he's getting in more and more and more out of his depth, he keeps drinking more. Oh, which I think it's a really nice, really nice. Um, Really, really nice, such a nice bit of characterization. Like this man, he's panicking. He's he's 
he's suddenly panicking and this one man army is just taking down absolutely everything. Mm. The man he thought he got rid of in nineteen in nineteen eighty six has come back for revenge and you know this general thinks he's the he's the big big man, he's the big I am, but actually stick him next to Yanis and he's he's nothing. Mm. And it's a really he, he comes across as a lot more human for his failings. So there's a really nice bit of acting, nice bit of um, direction there for him. Um yeah, I like the whole seven I say the whole seven I uh, sequence as well, where uh, they land there and um, you know, Xenia on the top again, fantastic Bond girl name, Bond girl with the stupid name, you know, it's reassuring, but she's tough as nails. You know, she's not a simpering 70s Bond girl, but she is absolutely she's a hard case. She, she's like evil Lynn in um in in, in <laughs> Hema. Uh, and that whole bit where they, where they take out the seven ayah when he goes in for a so-called inspection it's a fantastic sequence where the EMP mm. goes off it's brilliant yeah so yeah I always found that there was more tension I felt there was more tension between Bond and uh, on the top than there was between um, that and Isabella Sirutko's character uh, which is um, I can't think of the character's name was now how appalling is that you've watched it Ed this week anyway Natalia Simeonova Natalia that's the one <laughs> You don't need the gun, Commander. That depends on your definition of safe sex. It's close enough. Not for what I hear in mind. Now, things that let you down, though, I, I've said it's a perfect film. It, it did, well, it doesn't even let it down, but it's, a, again, another thing to do with the Prosnan era, the MW Z3. We start off with the Aston Martin at the beginning. We start off so well. And then nothing wrong with the BMW Z3, but it kind of let set lay the the way that it was going to go, wasn't it? Because you had loads of BMWs. Did all. It, it, it did. I mean, of the three, of the three films that the BMWs were in, um, there's only The World Is Not Enough, no, sorry, not not that one. It's only tomorrow never dies, where it has a meaningful sequence. Um, it, it's it's just there in Golden Eye. I mean, Q mentions a lot of his gadgets. You don't see any of them. There's that throwaway uh, throwaway joke to uh, to Wade. He says, "Don't press any of the buttons. Um, I'm just going to go bombing around in it." Exactly, exactly. Um, tomorrow never dies. Obviously, there's a great sequence in the car park in Germany in Berlin. Um, but yeah. World is not enough. Yeah, okay, it moves forward a little bit and fires a rocket and then gets cut in half. It it never has a car in a bond in a bond film screamed so much of product placement and we've got a big fat deal from BMW. You know, if it's, it's no, no. I did know someone who at the time who had got a BMW Z3 imported because obviously uh, when the film had just come out and he got this guy got stopped by the police about three times. Not because he's actually done anything, because the police officers wanted to see the BMW Z3. <laughs> <'Cause it was laughs> like the Bond car. I remember him being very unfairly derided in the press at the time as being a hairdresser's car. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can see it. Maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a petrol head in any sense of the word. I have no idea of what a good car or a bad car is. I like Aston Martins because they look beautiful. I have no idea if a BMW Z3 is a good car or not. But I do remember it was very unfairly derided. Um, and I, sure, I don't I don't care that it wasn't an Aston Martin, it's just do something with it. You know, if you're gonna have make a big deal about your car, then you know, do something fun with it. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, because to be fair, Roger didn't really have the Astons really, did he? He had Lotus and stuff like that and the uh, Citroen. <laughs> so Citroen, but yeah. he made it work, well, it. he made it work on screen. But the thing that of, of all of them, the of the there's three bonds that have the car that you really identify. With them, I know Daniel Craig had a couple of Aston Martins, but did he have a car that you really identified him and his Bond to? I don't think so. Connery obviously had the DB5, um, more the Lotus Esprit. Dalton had um, the you know the updated Aston Martin, the Volante, um, and he only did a couple of films. But you, if you're going to imagine him in in the part, you'll imagine him driving it. I don't think that Brosnan. We're not even going to mention the vanish. We're not even going to talk about that monstrosity of, a, of an idea. Um, 
I don't think Brosnan, um, Lazenby, or um, or Craig have the iconic car. They are, we know what they, we know what they drove, and purists will will know exactly what model and make they were. But they're not iconic in the way that those three uh, Bond cars are for me. But he's, maybe maybe the tank is more iconic. Well, I think so because that's what we used the chase, wasn't it? I remember Roger yeah. Spottis would uh, said that was the, the thing that really stuck out for him when he was directed. Um, uh, tomorrow never dies. You know, he went the opposite way. He said, "Well, you can't get bigger than a tank chase, so I'll put him on a motorbike and, and put him through the you know, narrow streets in in China." But um, and it probably was that. That's clearly the substitute for the car chase, and it was a really clever way of incorporating what is, a, I suppose, a tired trope of the action car chase, and make it level, so make it a tank, St. Petersburg. <laughs> Meanwhile, Oromov is getting drunk in the back of his little larder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and we love that yeah I'm, I'm with you there ed i agree with you ed now what what other little what other things about this absolutely perfect james film james do you have issue with <laughs> I don't, oh, i'm sorry but it is perfect but i do have issue with it so what have, what what problems have i had so far score i don't you like don't, the score yeah you don't like the score um you're not sure about sean bean um, no, I mean, I, I like Sean Bean. I, guess, I don't, I guess, I don't guess, buy the Disley no. Cossack. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mini Driver, why was she in there? I don't know. Um, oh, singing, that was uh-huh. fun. Oh, Lord, That was fun. And Robbie Coltrane, I thought, yeah, that, that's the kind of piece of casting. It's either going to work really well or it's going to fall on its ass. And he, he nailed that part. I thought he was fantastic. And a little bit, a little bit of banter, you know, um, you know, my knee aches every day. And you know, the skill was not to hit your knee, but to miss the rest of you. It's, yeah. it's just so bondian. When, he, um, when, he's, when he's with Joe Don Baker and they're like, do you know him? And he goes, I gave him the limp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's 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 so well done. I don't mind Mini Driver being there, it's, but it's a bit of a laugh. Um, now there's there's so much more to love about this film um, than, um, than than there is to criticise, and we're only you know being critical because we're really looking for things. Um, but you know the new M Judy Dench obviously goes on for a, to a hell of a career as M. She nails it right from the from her first appearance when um, you know Tanner turned around and she stood there. It's brilliant. Samantha Bond straight away brings Bunny Penny into uh, into the new decade, um, and, and tells you we are without without you know, turning to the camera and telling you directly. It's pretty obvious that's going to be a very different dynamic between them from here on in. She's going to have a lot more power within that uh, that relationship. I like that they bring Tanner in. I thought that was that was that was good for uh, first real time. We've it has been mentioned a couple of times in the series first. Real time, we've seen him and his relationship with Bond. The, the callbacks, I'm a, I'm a funny one for callbacks. I like them, but they have to be done well. And you know, No Time to Die was so stuffed full of callbacks. And um, uh, and same with uh, Die Another Day. They're so stuffed full of them, it becomes you know intrusive to the story you're trying to tell. But I think in Goldeneye, they get it perfect. You've got these new people in post, but you have Q there. Bit of reassurance. You have the Aston Martin there, but we'll give him a new car for the for the for the modern era. It's very very well done. Everything that you love about Bond, from what you remember growing up and what you remember from the last twenty years, is there, but done differently and twisted slightly. It's like when you do a comic book movie, and I always have a big problem with origin movies uh, for comic book heroes um, because I don't think they ever get the origin movie right. But the, the one occasion, I suppose, was Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire, and I thought, this is exactly how you make a comic book origin movie. And Goldeneye was exactly how you bring Bond from the 70s, 80s into the mid-90s. It, they, just, they just got it spot on. I thought it was great. And on that bombshell, I've been Ashley signing off. Good night. Good night, I've been Ed. Good night. I've been James. James. Yeah. yeah, cheerio. <laughs>